I thank Dr. White and Joy for the opportunity to come back and to minister the Word of God in chapel. Through the years, my favorite audience has always been the college student, and especially here at Cedarville. And I am glad for how God continues to bless Dr. White and Joy and the administrative team and the board of trustees. I'm so thankful that many of the trustees are able to be with us in chapel, but especially their wives. The wives have gathered today for chapel, and then they're going to have a luncheon together with Mrs. White and with Pat. And so thank you, wives, for all that you mean to the school and all that you mean to your husbands. I, uh, let's let them know, yes. Through the years, I've always wanted to make it very clear that these 40 years at Cedarville, it's not been my effort, but it's been a team effort. Trustees, administrators, faculty, staff, but especially the greatest help has been Pat. I mean, I can't begin to tell you what these 58 years with her have meant to me and as I've been at Cedarville, and we've had this privilege of serving our Lord together. So thank you, honey. So glad that she could be here. And I just love homecoming week and the alumni and the many already here. Some I've had the privilege of seeing others who are coming in. Many years ago in my presidency, the first thing I would say to the students on that very first session was if you ever have a need the rest of your life and you've been at Cedarville for a quarter or later a semester, call me collect. And so I have lots of neat stories to tell about all those calls. Uh, I still recall the freshman I'm a, and I'm for some of you students, this is brand new. You did not know that there was such a thing as a collect call. In this day, uh, the, old, the trustees understand that, but you don't. But I got this call, and the young man tells the operator, she's saying, will you accept this call? He said, I'm one of your students. I said, I'll accept it. He said, Dr. Dixon, I'm a freshman. I'm out at the Dayton Mall, and I lock my keys in my car. Can you help me? <laughs> and so I sent someone from security out there to help him get his keys out of his car. One of my favorites was it was a Sunday morning, and I got the, will you accept the call? Yes. And the young man said, I'm with the sword bearers. And we did an all-nighter over here in Indianapolis. And we stopped at McDonald's for breakfast. I went back to the bathroom and the team left without me. <laughs> Can you help me, Dr. Dixon? <laughs> and so I was able to call a pastor who was one of our board members, Don Tyler, in Indianapolis. And they made some arrangements to go see him and to pick him up and to bring him. And it just lots and lots of stories. But I can remember as well those sad calls from the dormitory. Dr. Dixon, I just got the message that my father went home to be with the Lord today. Or my mother has been taken to the hospital. In fact, Lynn Brock spoke in chapel, I'll never forget that call. His father, Bill Brock, was one of the finest men I've ever known in my life. He was chairman of the board of trustees at times. He was the head of the GARB in the state of Ohio. He was respected so widely. And it was about 2.30 in the morning. And Lynn called and said, uh, my father just died with a heart attack during the night. Today I am preaching on the topic, the trials of the Cedarville student. But they just aren't the present student, they're the students of the past. 
There are trustees, faculty, staff, donors. It's actually the Cedarville family. Warren Wearsby wrote a book entitled The Bumps Are What You Climb On. And he tells the story of a little boy leading his sister up a mountain. And she said, I don't like this path. It's so rocky. And he said, the bumps are what you climb on. And there are a lot of bumps in life. A number of our alumni who will be coming back will be seeking out faculty and staff to talk about some of their bumps and some of the trials and the tough times that they're going through right now. Sometimes it has to do with disease. As I understand it, there are those in our student body right now whose parents are going through some really tough times physically. I think one of them was an RA that was reported to me because I didn't want to just talk to you about the trials of the past, but the trials right now in the dormitories that some of you have that nobody else knows about. Sometimes it's disease, sometimes it's death. I, I've kept every funeral message that I ever preached and I end up preaching a lot of funerals. Down in Florida, here when some of our old timers go home to be with the Lord, administrators, wives, occasionally a trustee or a trustee wife, I've kept them all. But I'll never forget that night. I was out preaching, I think in Cincinnati. I heard about it on the way home when I called Pat. Pat was the advisor to the yearbook. And she loved those who were on the yearbook staff and this particular group that year, she was so close to them. They were a very crazy group of young men and young women, and they always loved Pat. And so this particular night, they were going on a Young's run, and they came by our house. We lived on Scott Street. And they came up to the door and said, Miss D, would you like to go on a Young's run with us? And she said, I just can't. I just don't have the time, and I'm, I, I, I appreciate it. Have a good time. On the way to Young's, a drunk driving on the wrong side of the road hit them head on. Two of them were killed that night in that wreck. I preached two memorial services right in the chapel at that time. I spent most of the night in the dormitories, not just the dormitories where the students lived, but just the other dormitories going around to seeing how they were doing. as they were going through the trial of death. You see, we have the idea that you don't die this young, right? You don't die at 18 or 19 or 20 or 21. Yeah, you do. And your parents die and grandparents die and friends die. It's just part of life. But those are the trials. And then divorce. I, I cannot begin to tell you one of the most heartbreaking things, two of them would be when it came to death, the number of kids who would say, my brother committed suicide, my sister committed suicide, my dad committed suicide, please pray for me. But then the kids who would come and say, Dr. Dixon, please pray for me, my parents are getting divorced today. And we'd stand there and we'd pray. I remember the graduate, graduation day, who got home with their mom and dad, and dad, a medical doctor, 
She said, he walked in. And Dr. Dixon, we, I've just graduated. He announces to the family he's divorcing my mom. And she just wept and wept over the telephone. Some of you identify with these things. Some of you, your parents have recently been divorced or they're not getting along. And you're going through the classes and you're going through the motions, but there's a deep pain inside in that agony. And there's just disappointment. Some of you are so disappointed because you were in love with that guy. And here in the last two weeks, he said, I don't think so. Are you in love with her? And maybe you were engaged and she broke it off. I've known of some who were engaged and wedding gifts coming in and the date is set and headed that way only to have it fall apart and have to send the checks back and the gifts back. We're talking about trials. We're talking about life and reality. Some of you are facing the trial of finances and your dad lost his job or mom and how are you going to pay for the next semester? Some of you, it's an emotional trial. You, you really wrestle. You're bipolar. Most of the time when you stay on your medicines, you're okay. And you get off your medicines, you're not. And you go through deep, deep valleys of depression. Now the question is, why does God allow us to go through these trials? I'm going to read from the New Living Translation 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Yesterday, Lynn Brock brought a message on how we got our Bibles. In tribute to the Word of God, would you stand with me, please, while I read? 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 11. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Now, in your minds, I want you to listen to how many times the Apostle Paul in this passage talks about our need of comfort. He's the source of all comfort. He, God, comforts us in all of our troubles so we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. The more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Stop. You know what he just said? The more trouble we have, the more comfort we're going to experience. Few trials, little comfort. Lots of trials, Lots of comfort. We are confident that you share in our sufferings and you will also share in the comfort God gives us. We thank you all to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the troubles we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed, overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. You been there? where you really wondered, can I make it through it? I want you to get this. Some of you are just coming out of trials. Others are in the midst. Others, you didn't know it, but you're getting ready to go into them. And the Apostle Paul talks about his trials and what happened in Asia we thought we would never be able to live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. 
you're helping us by praying for us, then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. May I suggest? I know you hear a lot of preaching. Love the word of God. I always love to preach here because of the way you listen. But how about sometime before you go to bed tonight, reading that passage again, asking God to speak to your hearts. Thank you. You may be seated. Why does God allow us to go through all these tough times? Well, he gives us three reasons in the text. Number one, that we might be a caring people. Verse four, he comforts us in all of our trials so that we may be able to comfort them with the same comfort that God gives us. Do you understand that 2 Corinthians is Paul's autobiography? Read it in that light. As you go through 2 Corinthians, how he talks about what he's experienced here and experienced there and in body and out of body and with God. And he just talks about his pain and his suffering. A.W. Tozer said, it's doubtful God can bless a man or woman greatly until he has hurt them deeply. You may sit there today and say, you know, I have to look at my life and say it's been pretty much an easy walk. Wonderful family, had a great church, a lot of good things going on. Things are off to a good start here at Cedarville. It won't stay that way. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but this is life. This is reality. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. And he says he comforts us. And in the midst of our pain, he's there for us so that we can have a ministry to others. Through the years, I always like to talk to the college students about we aren't all wired the same. I just love the fact that you get to live in the dormitory. You're from Rhode Island, and she's from Birmingham, Alabama, and you don't even talk the same language. (laughs) And you don't eat the same food. And she's trying to explain to you that it's worth trying turnip greens. (laughs) You get in the dormitory, you've lived in that one community most of your life, And now you're in that dormitory and people don't look the same or think the same, talk the same. That's great. I wish more churches would understand that. We don't have to be wired the same. The Bible talks about unity, but it never talks about uniformity. And let's give each other room to think and room to make decisions and room to move the way we think we need to move. And that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about how we are going to be going through tough times. Some of you are naturally caring people. Generally speaking, the ladies, the women, care more and deeper than we do as men has a lot to do with wiring, maleness, femaleness. But there are some men who don't have a problem picking up a telephone and calling someone to check them out and see, hey, how you doing? I've worked with uh, professional men down in Florida for 15 years. We call them men's fellowships. Four different country clubs. Mediterra, Shadowwood, Imperial, Gray Oaks, and... uh, When we left this last April to head north, we were having 175 men a week come. Most of these men are unsaved. Most of them are multimillionaires. They've been very successful in their corporate lives and so forth. And I say, why do you come? They say, because we have lived our lives for our businesses, made a lot of money, lost our families in the process, and this is the first time we've ever had a chance to at least hear about God. Furthermore, we're going to die, and we're not sure we're ready to die. 
That's why we come, Paul. And you let us think for ourselves. You let us ask any question. I have Buddhists who come. Judah, I, I can't tell you the number of Jewish people who come, guys. Lots of Catholics, Methodists, Baptists as well, but a predominance of Catholics and the others and agnostics. And they'll come to me and they'll say, Paul, I did not know that it was important to write a handwritten note to somebody to say thank you until I started coming to your men's fellowships. That's maleness. It's this whole idea that you know, the wives do it, but we don't do it. I want you to know that Scripture says there's coming a time when you're going to be in such pressure that you're going to, without trying, become a caring person. A loved one's going to die. Or you're going to be in the hospital. And you'll be changed. Paul said that God allows these things that we might be caring people. I love it. Somebody said, God does not comfort us to make us comfortable, but to make us comforters. Think about that. So God allows it that we might be a caring people. Number two, that we might be a humble people, verse nine. Uh, thank you, praise band, for that song about humility. Verse 9, the Apostle Paul said, In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Men and women, we are so prideful, and God hates it. Some of you are proud of your intellect. Yeah, really good ACT and SAT. I'm glad for that. Keep it up. Don't take it for granted. That's not going to determine your grade on your test. The, uh, these faculty don't check your ACT scores. They want to see you, what you do in the test. Some of you have a tendency to be proud of your academic prowess. Some of you are proud of you look in the mirror and, you know, in all honesty, you're pretty good looking. Good-looking men, good-looking women. And you look. Some of you are proud of your athletic skills. Basketball season starting. We taught a soccer game, volleyball, men and women. I'm so glad for the athletic program here. And by the way, some of you are proud of your theology. It always blew me away. Uh, I have a, no, uh, on this issue of Calvinism and Arminianism, the one thing I've never been able to understand is how a Calvinist can be proud. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. If it's all of God, and it is, How did we ever come to truth apart from God? We just aren't that smart. The scripture says, Paul said in another place to the Corinthians, who makes you to differ from another? What do you have that you didn't receive? Now, if you received it, why do you glory as if you hadn't received it? And you know what will take away all that pride? Trials. That's what scripture says. Paul said that God allowed me to go through this so that I wouldn't continue to have confidence in myself. Margaret Clausen said, grace grows best in winter. Daniel po uh, Patrick Moynihan, I used to really like when Moynihan was there and Reagan was president and they'd go at each other and then they'd go out and have a cup of coffee after it was over and they just respected each other, though we were on two sides of the aisle. After JFK was assassinated, Moynihan said, when you're Irish, one thing you learn is that sooner or later this world will break your heart. You don't have to be Irish. 
Just have to be a human being. Sooner or later, this world will break your heart. And God allows it so we might be a caring people, a humble people, and that we might be a praying and a thankful people. Look at verse 11. You are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. He said, you've become a praying people because you knew we were going through tough times. Students, faculty, staff, graduates, trustees, I hope we're all praying, people. I hope we all have our prayer lists. But you never pray like you pray in the midst of trial. Right? Different kind of prayer life. Different kind of prayers. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. The tough times drive us to prayer. One of the books that I have sent out by literally the scores and probably hundreds is Rules from the Red Sea. God-given strategies for difficult times. The same God that leads you in will lead you out. And I commend it to all. It's just a little book. It's about the Red Sea and what we learn from it. You know, one of my favorite chapters is in the midst of our trial, in the midst of the Red Sea, the question isn't how do I get out? The question is how do I glorify God in it? So God allows these trials that we might be praying and that we might be thankful. As Viktor Frankl said, the survivor of the Holocaust Life is not an experience to be enjoyed, rather a difficult journey we've been assigned. That's right. We don't live to enjoy necessarily, but to understand there are going to be some tough times, and they are assigned to us, and we need to learn from them. While I was president, one of the series that I brought, I think back in the early 80s, was the trials of the college student. And I built that entire series. I would preach it just like I'm so thankful for Dr. White and his series and on the book of Ephesians now and Proverbs in the past and he teaches the books of the Bible. And he does it on Monday mornings and I did too. And that year I did the series on the trials of the college student built around Job 23.10. In Job 23, 10, he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. In the student body that year was a young man by the name of Curtis Hoke. In fact, he was the president of the student body. I called Curtis last week. I talked this through with him to make sure I got it right. When he was a teenager, I went to his church in Meadville, Pennsylvania, and had an evangelistic campaign. He and his family had started going there. They'd been in a liberal church. They were searching. And I was privileged to be there and preach the gospel. And as a teenager, Curtis received Christ. He came to Cedarville. He came the year after I started as president. He became president of the student body. He was greatly loved by the students. He got engaged to one of our seniors. And that summer, Curtis was out swimming. I, I wrote these notes down last week when I talked to him. He was out swimming on July the 31st, 26 days before his wedding. And he dived into a shallow pond and broke his neck. And a friend pulled him out or he would have drowned. He became a paraplegic. He's on the bank. 
And he said, I, I told him, call Dr. Dixon and tell him, the Lord knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He was in the hospital for six months. He broke off the engagement. He didn't think it was right for his fiance to go through with this, with him spending the rest of his life without the use of his limbs and in a wheelchair. And two months later, she came with her mother to say, I want to marry you. And they got married. As far as I know, and as far as he knows, a paraplegic has never been known to give birth to a child. They had a daughter. That daughter graduated from here. Her name was Cindy. In fact, as you look at that, one of those pictures that's up there, he, he was the alumnus of the year in 2005, and you see a picture where he came back to speak in chapel in his wheelchair, and he had his daughter on the back of the wheelchair, and he was doing wheelies all over the platform. <laughs> they have been living for God as a family. It is such a neat story. I am so grateful for Curtis Hoke, who's a model of a lifetime of trials. And yet God has fulfilled his purpose of him and comfort and comforting others. What they do, he's like a, a Johnny Erickson. How he ministers to people like that and then being humble and being praying and thankful. You say, how am I going to make it with what I'm going through now or what I may face? I had a song for 25 years that we would sing. It was almost like the alma mater. It was called Christ is All I Need. Many of our graduates, some who are here now, used it in their weddings. But my f unbelievable story is the day that our graduate married to our graduate. He's a youth pastor in that church, and she would bring him lunch every day and their little daughter and walked into his office, and he was dead. And she said, Dr. Dixon, I took my daughter, and I went into the church, and I knelt by the pew, and I sang, Christ is all I need. Would you stand with me, please, as we close? Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need. I thank the Lord for you. Have a wonderful day.